ABA is Applied Behavior Analysis. There's four common misconceptions. What's the, what's the biggest misconception? We've ar I've already talked about it. ABA is only for students or children diagnosed with autism. A big, big misconception. ABA is applied to, you know, we, you know, actually, you know, you've heard about positive behavior interventions and supports, right? PBIS, which is a big push for that now, looking at your PBIS numbers and your, your you know, your office disciplinary referral data. It's a, it's a big thing that we do. A lot of that research comes out of, you, you know, comes from behavior analysts. Um, so uh, ABA is not just about autism. ABA is only for kids who have problem behaviors. We hear that a lot. He doesn't need ABA. He doesn't need a behavior intervention plan. He doesn't need that because he's not engaging in problem behaviors. See that a lot. There's no problem behaviors, no ABA needed. ABA is only for kids who are engaging in aggression, self-injurious behavior, disruptive behavior. We'll get into a little bit more of that in terms of the application later. In order to implement and uh, put ABA principles in practice, you don't have to be a BCBA or a BCABA. In fact, you actually don't even need to be a BCBA, BCABA to conduct a functional behavioral assessment. In New Jersey and other states where there's a lot of BCBAs, when there's a lot of due process litigation, do you want to have a BCBA or BCBA do these kind of things? Yes, more likely than not, but you don't have to. I know a lot of great school psychologists who write really good FBAs. But the bottom line is, the, the, we have a lot of power professionals that we train to implement behavior plans. You know, they're not BCBAs, BCABAs, or registered behavioral technicians. So you don't have to be. There's nothing in the regu you know, regulatory code, nothing in the statutory code. Some states do. They have licensure requirements. They have other things. They have they have provisions uh, with regard to uh, you know uh, who can provide uh, ABA services in schools, who can get off FBAs, and things like that. New Jersey doesn't have that. And the federal law doesn't mandate, mandate that. So the bottom line is you can implement and utilize ABA principles under the training of a BCBA or BCABA. And that's important to remember. Misconception number four, probably one of the most, uh, probably one of the more common ones that we hear a lot. What do you hear about when you talk, when, you have a, when you're trying to put a behavior in a finished place? What do teachers often say? That's bribery. You're just bribing them. Yeah, of course they're behaving for you. You ever hear that? You're feeding them M&Ms. You're giving them the iPad. Of course they're behaving for you. It's not bribery, it's called reinforcement. And the other thing we often hear is, why should I be rewarding that child for something they should already be doing? Or, it's not fair to the other students. I do a lot, you hear that all the time, don't you? I do so many workshops for teachers, and less and less anymore because now I'm training other people uh, to do presentations, especially for teachers and powers. We have to meet the individual needs of the students. Some kids need more what we call extrinsic motivation. Not all kids are intrinsically motivated to read or, 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 or work on their writing because they know that, in, they, they, they realize that later on they'll be able to read higher level books that will appeal to their interests or not a lot of kids are motivated to do their work so that they get good grades, so they get that A and they come home and somebody says, oh, you got an A, that's awesome. Some of that, a lot of that is intrinsic motivation, right? Not all kids are intrinsically motivated, especially our most challenging. So when we talk about bribery, reinforcement, it's not bribery, it's positive reinforcement. The other thing I'll tell you is if you ask some of the students in the classroom, this happens all the time, maybe this is something that you guys can do in your district sometimes, and when you have a really challenging student who is allowed to have breaks where he can go on the computer, go on the iPad for 10 or 15 minutes, or is allowed to take walks around the hallway, things that the other students are not allowed to do, right? Ask this, first of all, observe the students and then ask the students, okay? Students are very understanding, especially at a young age. They get used to it. How many classrooms do you have where you have kids who are screaming or engaging in problem behaviors and the other kids just are able to ignore it and continue working? It happens all the time. Sometimes you'll ask the students 
and the students will say, I'm okay with him going on the iPad, even though I wish I could go on the iPad three times a day because, you know, Bob, Billy really needs that right now, you know? Like, they'll tell you. And sometimes they'll even go a little further and say, I'm so happy that he's allowed uh, to, to, to have that extra privilege because now he's not disrupting me so I can learn. I've had kindergartners tell me things like that. So, and the other point of it is, is that reinforce, reinforcement is meant to be temporary. When it's implemented correctly, it's used on a short-term basis to build fluency in appropriate adaptive behavior skills and then fade it out.